Welcome to the System Design and Management webinar series. The System Design and Management program is a mid-career master's degree program that is jointly offered by MIT School of Engineering and the MIT Sloan School of Management. The System Design and Management program provides a system thinking perspective that integrates management, technology, and social sciences to address rapidly accelerating complexity and change in today's global markets. Graduates earn a Master of Science degree in Engineering and Management. The SDM program also offers a one-year certificate in Systems and Product Development. We're pleased today to have Jay Raj Nair present on making a successful digital transformation with IoT. Jay Raj Nair is the global head of IoT at YPRO, where he sets the company's strategic and technological direction. A computer engineer with more than 20 years of experience in information technology, he previously held leadership roles at Infosys, EMC, and Intel. He holds a master's degree in engineering and management earned through the MIT System Design and Management program. He also earned an MBA from Iowa State University and a bachelor's degree in engineering from Amravati University in India. In India. Jay Raj will present for approximately 45 minutes and then we'll open up the webinar for questions. Please use the chat feature on the webinar to ask questions and we'll respond to as many as possible. Please join me in welcoming Jay Raj Nair for his talk today. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's uh, an incredible honor to be back here on campus. I was uh, uh, reminiscing while walking through the campus this morning. Uh, what a great place it is uh, and in terms of learning and continuous learning. Uh, life is all about um, training and retraining oneself. So SDM gives a fantastic opportunity, has given me an uh, excellent opportunity a long time ago to go through this experience. So I really appreciate this opportunity to share. Um, I lead the IoT business for Wipro, and it's a significant growing business. Um, IoT is the buzzword or has been the buzzword for the last few years. Uh, if you really look at what it is, it's just an amalgamation and collection of technologies that enable business transformation. And the way we approach it, it's not just an engineering feat. I'd like to kind of walk you through some of the very basic constructs uh, and different ways of looking at it. Um, it's not a very prescriptive approach, but I'm hoping that in the last uh, 15 to 30 minutes, we can have an interactive engagement where I can answer some of these questions. So Wipro is uh, about an $8 billion uh, company uh, with multiple business units and service lines. I just wanted to give you a little bit of context. We serve thousands of customers globally, and we have a global footprint, a significant one, which includes, it's one of the largest Indian SIs, but with significant local presence. More than half of our the teams here are uh, in the U.S., are based in the U.S., so is the case in Europe. Uh, if you look at the different verticals and business units that we have, we have the banking and financial services sector. A lot of digital disruption is happening in that space. Uh, manufacturing and technology, of course, is prime. If you must have heard of uh, the different uh, smart manufacturing technologies and approaches people are putting together, the industrial IoT platforms that people are putting together, most of them are coming from product manufacturing companies, and product to services transformation is huge in the space. Consumer, of course, we are full of wearables these days, so anything is smart uh, and connected. Uh, lots of very exciting uh, changes happening to the way we live and we work. Uh, healthcare life sciences is an amazing space. I think the number of uh, advances um, in terms of uh, how do you get good connected healthcare in, uh, how do you get uh, data from remote settings and data from clinical settings together, um, and kind of give a singular, insular kind of a dashboard view, very important. Uh, energy, natural resources is an area where, you know, it's highly automated, very significant play in terms of asset management. If you look at a mining sector, uh, you look at the big assets that they have in operations. To be able to remotely monitor them, to manage them, it is all enabled through IoT technologies in terms of being smart, being able to sense and detect, and stay connected. Communications is another area where there's a lot of the people who provide the pipe. Look at the amount of bandwidth we have at our, uh, we have uh, to use today. It's significantly more uh, than what it used to be, and the amount of, uh, and the volume and velocity of data that flows through these pipes is uh, significant. So net new services, net new experiences can be crafted uh, through these uh, telecom technologies. Uh, from a service line, service line standpoint, just a quick uh, summary, we do global infrastructure services, we do application development, 
we do product engineering from concept to kind of implementation of large scale uh, product engineering uh, projects. Analytics is, and insights has become uh, the core uh, of how you generate value these days, uh, implying that uh, the high volume, high velocity data I alluded to earlier, uh, contextualizing all this data, putting that in a big data lake, conducting a lot of analytics on it and trying to get those nuggets of insights is where the value actually gets realized. Improving customer experiences, improving product efficiencies, utilization levels, all of that is a function of analytics. Analytics actually has progressed a lot uh, with the net new buzzword around artificial intelligence lately. You must have seen the amount of cognitive technologies that are coming to bear on this high volume data so that you can generate uh, apply machine learning techniques to generating more insights and better insights. Uh, digital is the way things are. I mean, uh, what is not digital today uh, is obviously a question to ask if literally in terms of how you engage, how you communicate, how you work, how do you connect and engage with machines, how do you run a smart manufacturing line, all of that is digital. So there's an immense amount of uh, transformation that is happening in the digital space. That's just a brief overview of uh, what we do as a services company. Uh, we have grown uh, through organic and inorganic ways. Uh, design has been a big focus for us. The largest design firm in Europe, Design It, uh, was acquired by us a while ago. Wipro Homes is an AI platform that we have built. Ventures is how you engage the startup ecosystem and get more uh, uh, contribution from the broader set of innovators that are out there today. Top Coder is a crowdsourcing platform. In fact, it is becoming more and more norm to actually create algorithms, to create unique IP, UIs, and experiences through crowdsourcing in a very faster time to market way using technologies like Top Coder. Perio is one of our recent acquisitions, and of course, digital is a capability we're growing across the board. So again, our intent always has been to enable clients digital transformation, and to do that, we have been growing organically and inorganically. <coughs> Let me get into um, the construct of a typical IoT program, right? If you look at a customer uh, and say, well, you know, I've got all these uh, smart connected products. How do I get value? Uh, either the products, if they're not smart, then how do you make them smart? If they're not connected, how do you make them connected? And then how do you realize genuine business value? Uh, out of that connectivity and the exchange of information. Uh, that is where clearly uh, the definition of a good strategy uh, makes sense. So as a part of an SDM program or an LFM program, uh, typically you got to really um, uh, think through what are the key dials uh, of business outcomes that you can realize. What are the key factors you can control? What is it that you're optimizing for, right? So that, that creation of that strategy and spending adequate amount of time up front doing some of the strategy work is very important. The design part is uh, where, as an engineer, typically I always tend to go run after getting things done, right? And, and so getting things done is usually is uh, before the design element uh, synthesis has been done, a lot of thought has gone into it. I'll start building uh, POCs and prototypes and uh, emulate, simulate uh, data when possible. But what we have realized it in efforts and initiatives where we have spent sufficient time designing the customer journeys, designing uh, the customer experiences, designing the machine to machine communication technologies, all of that time spent up front is well spent. Uh, it actually helps you do a better job at designing a solution that can sustain and actually make a material impact. Of course, the engineering fundamentals do exist. As good engineers, we have to think through the systems dynamics between these subsystems. Um, I will get into a little bit of more detail in terms of how you could actually, how do you transform from the OT world to the IT world in IoT, in terms of how do you create a digital twin, how do you create um, uh, an equivalent of the physical in the digital world, uh, th those are basic uh, engineering constructs and there are immense amount of tools and technologies that are available today at our disposal to, to enable this uh, transformation. But ideally when you have a good strategy, good design and good engineering capabilities, that's how you can structure a program and execute to it. 
Uh, if you do, you know, it's not like a very quantitative science saying 30% each, um, and you know, the rest is for deep thinkers. Um, uh, that is not the case, right? I mean, you do have to focus on strategy, design, and engineering, and that's where uh, that intersection uh, is what enables better value transformation. <coughs> so, b three different ways of working. I'll, um, there are many. I mean, ideally you can parse out a system and uh, come up with many uh, ways to optimize the way you work and enhance productivity. But uh, I'll just focus on three big deals, right, in the way we approach these mega projects, small projects, anything to do with the Internet of Things today or the Industrial Internet of Things. If you look at uh, uh, Beyond Silos, everybody says it, it's very difficult to achieve, uh, not just about functional area breaking barriers, like, you know, you have to make sure that if you're trying to do the operational equipment uh, efficiencies, um, uh, then it's not just the plant manager, but the financial controller who's also looking at the efficiency. So finance, engineering, plant, production, customer experiences, customer support. You start looking at different functional ways these organizations are set up today. You definitely have to break beyond these uh, silos to create a thread across individuals. From a system standpoint, if you really look at it, every system has got, uh, you can tier it up. And uh, tier it up into the edge tier, the platform tier, the enterprise tier, or and anything in between. So an end-to-end -end system stack uh, or a view of the system can also include many, many, many ingredients. So you have to make sure you look at it uh, beyond silos from a system standpoint as well. From a systems dynamic standpoint, I used to still remember the classes I took here on uh, learning the system dynamics, and we used to make these huge maps of how um, things are interconnected, and the costs and effect uh, across various subsystems, and how they propagate right over over a function of time. Uh, the uh, The point I'm trying to make is that in these large end-to-end -end systems, having a good understanding of uh, how do you break them, how do you represent them, and how do you interconnect various subsystems, very important. The second factor is around agility. Agility is the way. Uh, there is no waterfall traditional development cycles that span multiple years. People simply do not have the patience, or today's technologies actually enable a very agile way of developing uh, solutions, right? People also work differently today. Uh, so. The, the approach of ideating, validating, and actually implementing solutions in a very fast, agile manner, uh, very important. Um, the third part is outside-in. The uh, outside-in element has to do with uh, the ecosystem. Uh, if there is one company that can stand up today and say that, hey, I can build a vertically integrated stack and implement it for you, uh, that's a myth. Um, the notion is that across all these various tiers I talked about, the edge tier, the platform tier, or even the enterprise tier of an IoT solution, an end-to-end -end stack, you'll find multitudes of uh, leaders providing technology ingredients. You have to stitch it together. So working in a good partner engineering scenario with multitudes of partners in the ecosystem is, is a must too. So just to recap, you beyond silos, agile, and outside in are the three major vectors. I'll kind of deep dive into each one of them a little bit. <coughs> so, as far as beyond silos is concerned, one aspect that uh, ha I have to bring in is that uh, the way people work today and how collaboration is done, how we used to, like just the way we do SDM projects, or we used to do, S I used to do SDM projects, um, it's all about uh, bringing in uh, different sets of expertise and uh, and creating a diverse set of viewpoints uh, collectively engaged in solving one problem or one project or one uh, mission, right? Getting all the people together and collaborating in a very uh, dynamic way, uh, in a very co-creation, co-innovation kind of a model, that needs some sort of a framework. And what we have seen by doing hundreds and thousands of these projects over time is that uh, we can construct little cells where key stakeholders, cells are nothing but digital teams, uh, just a terminology, uh, creating the right teams, putting them together in a right construct 
bringing uh, and enabling the right environment to collaborate is a very important aspect. Uh, so never, underst underst uh, never underestimate the power of good engineers to solve a systems problem. But uh, at any cost, do not underestimate the power of a good team uh, and the ability of the team to collaborate and work well together. Uh, it, is a, it is a very crucial element uh, of most successful programs. In terms of um, uh, the services, products, and experiences, uh, we have been involved in, in the end-to-end -end stack from the innovation strategy all the way to product design and business process design. Let me get into specifics of uh, how we should do things differently. Right, so one of the things, one of the approaches with our acquisition of Design It that we learned is that design-centric uh, view or the human-centric view of building products and services is truly transformative. I think the today's generation expects a lot more, uh, both in terms of ease of use and the ways of working, uh, to be very different. So the traditional delivery-focused or you know uh, systems-first kind of view has to shift a little bit more towards human-centric, people-first, and more uh, from an approach standpoint, clearly around the discovery-led approach. A discovery-led approach is something where you do not have a finite understanding of what your end goals uh, are going to be. You discover it along the way, and then you cross the bridge when you get there. So uh, I think you shape and size, and you construct programs and projects uh, systems projects that are bounded in some sense of time and some sense of expectations, uh, but at the same time, the ability to be agile enough uh, to be focused on learnings as you go, and then you build your plan, not like flying an aircraft and building it at the same time. I think you have the core infrastructure and the elements in place. But uh, the ability to do discovery-led is very important. <coughs> so I mentioned about um, this digital lighthouse. I mentioned about how do you get people to come together. I think one of the constructs that we follow, which is a very good approach to take uh, for most companies are doing that as innovation hubs and digital pods. Uh, we have about 17 of them around the world where we bring uh, our customers in, we get our engineers in, we get the right experts together. So having uh, a framework and an environment where ideation and co-creation can happen effectively uh, is very important. I think most of the projects, and frankly, SDM is no, uh, not a newcomer to this space. I mean, I learned uh, in my very first uh, week um, in a uh, long time ago, I won't say how long ago, but a long time ago, um, I learned um, we used to use the Lego uh, Mindstorms. Um, I think the newer generations are all the NXTs. So in the first week, we had to create a robot that would push another robot off the table. Um, and uh, I still remember the name of it uh, because we were from, uh, had a little California edge on the team. We called it the Fruitinator <laughs> because, because we had, because the thing was so light that we built and it was flying off by itself we had to place some heavy apples and oranges on top to give it enough uh, center of gravity or to lower it down. Uh, but the, 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 the part was teams had to come together. You know, We had to resist our own uh, impulses a lot to, to shape and drive. Um, so the, the idea of a co-creation uh, is how we all learn. The uh, idea is to be able to, willing, able, able to and willing to listen to others' ideas to listen to a diverse set of ideas. It's often tough, I mean, for engineers and type A personalities that are focused on getting things done. Uh, I personally fight through that urge all the time because I always have a prescriptive answer up my sleeve and my team always tells me to kind of slow down and kind of think through, uh, you know, a better way of doing it. So, so digital pods are an example of how you can actually co-create uh, and create, provide the right environment for it. Uh, this slide talks about the ecosystem play, innovation from the outside. I'm passionate about working with the ecosystem. Fundamentally, I do believe that uh, there is no uh, vertically integrated stack today, right? If I were to just look at uh, the, uh, one of the papers I did when I was here was around uh, uh, more about user-driven innovation. So how do you do use cases? How do you set up reference architecture? And then how do you put a stack together? 
in going through that exercise, what I found out, or even now when we do these hundreds of projects, is there is multitudes of uh, platform providers, multitude of technology providers, sensor providers, connectivity providers um, that you have to bring to bear. And you have to look out for the best uh, interest. And as an SI, best interest of the customer. So as, an, as a systems integrator, I think the advantage we get to have in this mix is that we are the voice of the customer. We tend to be the agnostic SI that will actually bring the best of breed technologies together to stitch an effective solution for the customer. Uh, so I have a list of names in here of the other people that we work with. I'll just give you a plethora of um, the industrial IoT space. Uh, let me explain this with an example. Uh, if you take uh, the case of uh, a system which is intended to increase uh, the operational efficiency of a product, a uh, product or call it an asset. It's an asset management solution. Right, you have to build one where now you want to understand how the product is being used, uh, what are the different uh, utilization levels of it, what are some of the various things that fail, how can you predict failure so that you can do what you call prevent unplanned downtime, so you're improving the maintenance efficiency of that product or that asset. Um, to create a system like that for asset management, assume that uh, that asset is deployed Let's take a coal mine, for example, and it's an excavator or a digger, which is a large industrial asset. Uh, or in a fixed, uh, that would be a moving asset example. Another could be an example where you have a fixed asset within a manufacturing plant. All of these assets, they have to be smart. They have to be connected. So when it comes to the sensor technologies and the computing at the edge tier, in terms of sense detect, processing at the edge, all of that, so if you look at the IA Intel architecture or you look at uh, ARM architecture, you, uh, this variety of technologies and computing and processing platforms and communication platforms that are available to you at the edge. So to make an uh, excavator that is out in the field smart and connected, and of course you have the canvas within the vehicle, you have a lot of uh, data being generated inside of the vehicle that you can get it out through uh, an existing ODB port or through some other ways, um, you know, add a peripheral uh, 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 unit to capture some of this information and then communicate it back to the cloud uh, on the back end. Now, multitudes of players can play at the end. You have to work with them. Now, you look at the, the back end cloud platforms. So if you look at the standard traditional infrastructure as a service providers, you look at AWS, you look at Azure, you look at Google's cloud platform, Every one of these platforms can have, have transformed. I mean, you get immense amount of scale on all compute, network, and storage technologies. Uh, you ingest all this data, and uh, you also have now a plethora of the industrial platforms. You look at Siemens, for example, they've got the MindSphere platform. You have Snyder that has the EcoStructure platform, Honeywell with the Sentience platform. IBM, of course, has uh, its own Watson IoT platform. You have a GE with Predix, you, and you name any industrial player. Everybody's got uh, a software as a service layer that is riding atop some of these uh, platform tiers. So when you think about the customer and you say, which platform do you pick? What, what are the services and apps that will ride on top of the platform? That involves a lot of uh, assessment and uh, uh, what do you call the best interest of the customer at mind in terms of poly-cloud scenarios where you have multiple clouds talking to each other, you have messaging and uh, information flowing across them. Somebody's got to be the clearing house in that process. All of these, as I explained this at the edge tier and the platform tier, I've already named about a dozen or so players who are relevant to the conversation. So to kind of pull myself back out of the weeds, again, it is an ecosystem play. It will be an ecosystem play. More and more creative technologies are created um, uh, and by multitudes of uh, stakeholders, and you have to bring them together. In terms of uh, that is a one-to-one -one touch, there is also a scenario where you could actually do multiple touches. Like uh, here in the Boston area, we have a good partnership with the Industrial uh, Internet Consortium based here near Needham. Uh, World Economic Forum, we work with them. They have a center for the fourth industrial revolution in. Um, in San Francisco, and of course, Industry Phototo has been uh, chugging out the Rami Phototo architecture for the industrial smart manufacturing space in Germany quite a lot. In fact, we're looking forward to Hanover Messe coming up in April. 
across the, the, these organizations and bodies also enable us to give a many-to-many -many touch point. So fundamentally for any IoT solution or any kind of a large systems, uh, um, systems uh, project, you should look at uh, how, do you, how do you work in a many-to-many -many touch point and on a one-on-one -on -one basis with your partner ecosystem. The next slide here talks about the end-to-end -end solutions. So the end-to-end -end solution, again, from the edge all the way to the enterprise, sensors, connectivity, platform, integration, analytics, you have ML and AI techniques uh, and capabilities on top. I'll give you an example. Again, I'll use the same mining example of an excavator out um, or a loader out in the coal, open pit coal mine, for example. In that case, uh, the sensors will detect uh, let's take a simple image sensor that is looking at the side wall of a truck or uh, that is going by, a loader that's going by, and uh, predict failures based on, um, you know, image analytics, good advanced image analytics, if the cuts on the side wall uh, are going to enable a catastrophic failure. So predicting failures. So ma improving maintenance efficiency is the key there. Now you look at another bot, which is actually more advanced bot, looking at all the contract losses on the suppliers of the and the maintaining operators of the asset, so that a certain clause can be triggered and a service uh, call can be set up. So service lifecycle management of the asset can be done as well. So literally, an amalgamation of technologies will enable this end-to-end -end stack. Um, I'll give you one example of how do you apply some SDM techniques. Uh, if I really look at um, how do you how do you look, um, let's just take the system, same system dynamics uh, as an example. How do you take a large system and you break it down it into its uh, subcomponents, uh, at least at a level where they make sense, right? Not at the very atomic uh, level. Uh, if you take um, a large um, uh, compressor, for example, and uh, you have different functional units within that and uh, how do you map the subsystem within they all have an ontology right they all are hierarchically uh, connected to each other in some manner so to represent that physical asset uh, in terms of its digital equivalent you have to actually map and create this ontology in a system so here it may be a graph database of some sort or in DB or whatever you might use to create the, um, the digital equivalent in a system. So now the system knows uh, that this is how um, now the technology or the IT stack or the digital stack knows how the system is actually constructed. So that when you get operational data coming in from sensors which are in one or the nth level subsystem within, it can actually associate itself to a failure or success within a subsystem. Right? So Creating this ontology and creating this digital equivalent involves a lot of um, uh, understanding of how a system can be uh, sized and broken into its subsequent components. The interfaces between these systems too, they're not uh, most, um, you know, products uh, are contained environments or contained systems. Uh, they don't tend to be very public uh, and transparent APIs. It's like black boxes, right, subsystems. We actually work with customers who are uh, suppliers to larger customers, and so we have subsystems that are embedded within larger sys complex systems. And the interrelationship between these subsystems is not very public. They're very proprietary, and it's exchanged via, um, you know, very complex uh, contractual obligations. But we have we get into the middle of it, and we have to understand how do you generalize or generalize certain interconnects, certain APIs, certain way these things work and plug together. Uh, so having a good acumen and knowledge about how do you parse systems, uh, how do you map them, how do you create and document, and most importantly, these digital equivalents of any system uh, has to be live. What that means is uh, change management and think about a jet engine and attached to an Airbus frame A380 that is flying for, say, Emirates uh, in the Middle East. Uh, you look at the operator, how many people touch that jet engine for maintenance whenever a uh, you know, maintenance bulletin comes out. So from the operator who touches and maintains that jet engine or one sub subsystem within the jet engine 
updates a certain valve and then making sure systemically you know that the current digital version of that asset that you have on record that you're operating against, simulating against, and emulating against is actually current. So keeping a digital uh, twin actually live uh, and keeping it current is a big challenge. Uh, so that's all of these things to do with uh, good systems dynamics perspective, good way of design thinking, good way of enabling and mapping and continuously staying on top of it uh, is a very important uh, aspect of doing IoT projects. Um, I'll to quickly talk through the velocity of innovation part. I think um, the agility, the ability to iterate fast and responsively, um, of course, collaboratively, because if you're a one-man show, you can run and do what you want to do, but it never um, can have the scale and the, the capability fulfillment of what a team can achieve. So within a digital lighthouse, within a digital cell, how do you get to be working in a very agile manner? So agility is uh, a leg of the stool that you cannot discard. If you were to look at a uh, three-leg stool where you talk about uh, beyond silos, agile and outside in, uh, you got to do all three. And there is no conflict of interest in doing things in a very agile manner. It's a different way of thinking. It's just absolutely a, a, a new uh, dynamic way of thinking. Wherever you're involved in projects, it's not like, uh, I don't know of any major uh, private sector projects that are done uh, in a cascade waterfall model that spans multiple years uh, today uh, versus it used to be the norm a few decades ago. So, so agile is the way to go. And a hummingbird is a good representation of how agile it is. Let me get into this uh, customer-led and agile-led approach in terms of designing aspects up front uh, when you work, when we work with a customer, the ability is this whole construct that is explained here on the slide is very simple. You've got to have a good perspective on how the asset environment looks. You have to have a vision of where you want to transform to, be it a product or a service, right? So as is and to be, and then you need a simple roadmap as a function of time on what that transformation roadmap is. So as is model to be model and a transformation roadmap. That is what your portfolio is. That's when we do major programs, multi-million dollar programs, that's how we construct them. Uh, it's not very complicated. Uh, I think the content is what is the most important aspect. The framework is just a very generic, uh, a good way of approaching it uh, so that there is attention to details on planning out a good to be uh, rather than just you know, sh you know, not spending enough cycles and planning for it. So the portfolio construction part, the better, more time, more quality time we spend on it, uh, the better is the execution aspects. Execution, of course, as I mentioned, is agile, right? Continuous solution and prototyping, development and implementation in a very continuous dynamic way. So it's agile, fast, iterative, discovery-led. So you're basically finding your way and are not very prescriptive uh, upfront. Uh, so this is, this is typically how good systems engineering projects should be constructed. Uh, today in today's generation, right? I mean, I've done a few of them to realize many mistakes uh, uh, that uh, I used to make. And uh, the idea is, the idea is, uh, you fail fast and you succeed fast uh, in a very agile way. Um, digital cell is something I talked about. The multidisciplinary team here. I will raise one point: is that I, I mean, it goes back to again. There are times in one of the finance uh, classes that I was doing. Um, as part of Sloan, um, uh, it wasn't ever a core strength of mine. And uh, having the right CPA who had actually done, uh, you know, publication of multiple annual statements for companies uh, in my team was very helpful, right? So, so getting the right experts as a as a diverse set of expertise into the mix uh, in a digital cell is very very important. I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't. Uh, say more about it, I think uh, the team is at the core of success or failure. And it is always the team. A team leader matters, right? Uh, team leader matters, but the team matters more uh, in terms of the types of skills they bring in, the type of uh, uh, collaborative, iterative uh, model they put in place. 
uh, that is what determines the success or failure of any large scale or small scale systems engineering project projects and programs. Um, again, in the sprints, learn fast, fail fast, succeed fast. Methodology is very simple. Methodology is not what is important. The important part is if there's one, three, I mean, one set of message that you would want to take from the session is uh, any major systems engineering programs and projects ought to consider uh, working beyond silos, working in an agile manner, and working with the outside in or the ecosystem perspective. Uh, the one other experience that I'd also share is that um, it's not just about designing it and building it. Uh, when you also take ownership about ru running some of it, right? For example, in case of IoT programs, we also do OT monitoring. Uh, we uh, have digital twins of the physical assets that show up on our dashboards, and our teams monitor uh, tens of thousands of assets that are out there. I'll give you an example here. In the case of JCB, which is again um, construction equipment. We have over 50,000 of them that are being monitored. Uh, so you can see which one is failing or which one is about to fail, what are some of the corrective actions you can take ahead of time. But the run it part, it is very important, uh, even at a smaller scale, if we were to do a large scale systems uh, engineering program, it would be very interesting to do the run it aspect because whenever you do the run it, it helps you build better projects build better, do a better design, uh, do a better solution uh, creation and implementation, because it, uh, you learn, right? And when you're operating, there's no better way to, to learn other than running things. Um, so when you run them, you do a better job upstream in the process. Here's a list of uh, a collection of IoT projects and programs and products and solutions uh, where we have done lots of projects. Uh, I can share specific technical details on any one of them, depending on the audience's interest. Uh, if you look at the, the asset intensive businesses, be it a factory setting or be it a fixed or a moving asset, even on the outside, even uh, anything that is valuable and can be optimized uh, for use, for maintenance, for uh, uh, any kind of operational e efficiency use cases, all of that around asset management, supply chain management, uh, logistics management, fleet management, uh, are very big and uh, are growing area of IoT business today. Uh, and it'll continue to because, you know, people want to do better product to services transformation and people do want to enhance uh, and improve the customer service or customer experience. In terms of the other spaces around smart infrastructure, literally every infrastructure today is smart if it's a greenfield environment. I think if you look at brownfield environments that are going through retrofit, and are getting smarter. Here in campus, you should go check out um, uh, Doppel Lab that uh, is part of Media Lab, right? Uh, some of the cool work that uh, uh, Dr. Joe Paradiso and team have done uh, in terms of uh, both Tidmarsh work is also pretty cool, but uh, there's a lot of innovative uh, ways to, to collect data, to visualize them, especially visualizing this high volume, high velocity information and then converting that into key nuggets and insights that are meaningful and are useful uh, is very important. I think there's a lot of work going on. The smart infrastructure space is very good uh, across different types of campuses and buildings and airports and public uh, smart city environments. Many, many use cases are being deployed in IoT and I can actually address them. So as part of this Q&A session, which we have another four, uh, about 20 minutes for, we'll cover all of these specific areas. And please feel free to ask me questions around any level of depth in any one of these solution areas. Uh, with that, I'll uh, take a pause. Uh, thank uh, for the time uh, and the opportunity to be back on campus. Um, um, I still wear the beaver ring very proudly. Um, having said that, I'll open it up for questions and answers. So. Uh, First off, as we get started with this, I'd love to have you um, use the chat feature if you have questions. Um, the first one that I have is a question that says, what is your approach when you need to balance exploitation of existing processes, resources, and products, and exploration of new markets, services, trends at WePro? Uh, a good question. Uh, exploitation versus exploration. Um, frankly, uh, new products and services, um, so 
um, you know, I can put it in the context of hunting and farming, right? Um, if you look at if you look at a traditional uh, process, uh, I'm sure when you look at it twice, you look at it three times, and you look at it from a different set of <laughs> stakeholders with different mindset, different perspective, you'll get opportunities to make it better. You'll identify ways of doing things better. So exploratory work around existing processes is not something that, uh, ex n not net new, I mean, exploitation may be the term that you use there. You can find nuggets and opportunities to improve experiences or to do things better in traditional processes. And it's always the people, process, and technology part, right? All these three have to go uh, change, right? So the people part, of, of course, involves a lot of change in terms of training, retraining, ramping up. So if it's an existing process that involves a certain way of doing things and involves a lot of stakeholders in this mix, uh, it takes um, a lot more time but that is the change that traditional organizations are going through today, right? Because you can't just uh, create net new services 100% uh, off the board uh, without consideration for what exists today. Because if, a pro because if I look at products in the IoT space, products that are already out there have a certain level of capability to sense and detect certain data, right? And the net new greenfield products are much more capable, much more advanced today. So the processes that are involved in machine-to-machine -machine communication and the, and the data that is being sent is substantially different. How do you create an abstraction layer? How do you homogenize this information? So here it is about a transformation play. It is about understanding the existing, uh, working to creating a transformational impact. Net new areas, of course there is, um, net new areas and greenfield areas or ideas or trying to come up with very new sets of services uh, that is uh, on an accelerated path today versus a decade ago or even two, three years ago. Because some of the types of information that is being collected uh, enable completely transformative products uh, to services uh, offerings. I mean, net new services that are complete, were not compl at all possible at some point, and now you're, uh, you know, renting assets out versus selling them. As an example, there are many, many places, I'll give you an example, where airlines are trying to, or jet engine manufacturers are trying to sell hours of flying time as a service. Uh, simple things like fragrance as a service. I mean, you walk into a hotel lobby, you smell um, fragrance, right? So the ability to sell uh, it as a service rather than sell the dispenser and sell the different consumables associated with it. So the ability to sense and detect has actually enabled a lot of net new transformation. Uh, so it's it's a combination on, and depending on the circumstances and the company you find yourselves in, uh, there is no one or the other answer. You, you farm and you make things better, at the same time you look for uh, very new innovative ways of doing business. All right, the next question that we have, <coughs> so uh, this comes from, uh, Student, how do you maintain competitive IP while managing interoperability within the fragmented ecosystem of IoT? Great question. In fact, uh, um, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, we have our own platforms that we stitch together with open source technologies. Um, we, uh, when we go through that exercise, we um, appreciate and love the IP that we have created, right, in terms of incremental how do you get that implemented in a customer environment? So some customers and clients do not want external IP. They want to have complete ownership uh, and change management. In those scenarios, it becomes a time to market opportunity where we may give source code licensing and, exec uh, and give, the, give the IP uh, so that uh, a solution can be deployed much, much faster, much more effectively. But when it comes to building solutions that are heterogeneous, I mean, there are very many ways of protecting IP. Um, if you l take the the edge, and if there's somebody who's doing distributed edge analytics, and uh, the IP or the expertise that they're bringing to bear is something that runs really well in terms of uh, just the uh, edge, which is a lower end uh, compute stack, right? Uh, in that case, uh, you have to create um, contractual frameworks where uh, you protect their IP. 
in terms of licensing there are many net new ways uh, people are stitching things together uh, I uh, usually look for agnostic ways where um, you know you don't impact anybody negatively in the chain first of all uh, IP protection is all around um, having good visibility and good understanding of what is the IP and who does it belong to and um, the customer usually is very keen to stitch the best solution for them so we when we stitch these things together we tend to tell uh, put explicit contractual terms in place where uh, nobody's IP is violated right uh, but uh, it is more more uh, complicated than that I'll give you another example where we build reference solutions when you build reference solutions in that case uh, you enable multiple partners to play more closely more effectively uh, we work with the industrial internet consortium here in Needham and uh, there is a concept of test beds uh, where you can actually set a, take a set of use cases, create reference architecture, and stand up some stack. Um, so I'll give you an example of an IIC approved recent test bed with um, the two of them. One of them I'll talk about is the connected worker test bed. So there are multiple partners involved in the mix. So when we get into a test bed, so because they're all IIC members, uh, there is actually a framework that enables collaboration and sharing of uh, IP right without explicitly giving control of it uh, so there is a framework that exists and then once we put a test bed together then we just do the TPA signatures uh, individually one-on-one -on -one, and then we can get it out so th when we work in these multi-partner ecosystems and bodies that enable this collaborative environments it becomes easier so uh, the, uh, the IIC test beds if you go to industrial internet consortium org and look at the test beds you can actually see like the microgrid test bed is Wipro, uh, National Instruments, uh, Cisco, RTI, um, and in the case, uh, all of these test beds, so everybody's bringing in their piece of acumen and knowledge and IP into the mix. But when you stitch together a reference solution like this, um, then it, it helps everybody win together with the customer. Uh, so that is one model in a many-to-many -many scenarios. But IP protection is very important, I think, understanding and have uh, respecting IP um, and making sure you have a governance framework that enables protection uh, is a must do especially in this uh, in the IOT world and consumable and consumer areas where there are multitudes of technologies that are coming in and they have a very short lifespan they come to bear and then they disappear it's a little bit uh, it, there again IP is important but it is a little bit different than how we traditionally approach uh, IP protection in the enterprise customer uh, landscape that we operate in. So the next <coughs> question that we have is a, a little bit more general. How are you using IoT for healthcare? Oh, um, IoT for healthcare is a is a very uh, broad set of capabilities. Um, uh, so if you look at um, uh, we work with a lot of diagnostic companies. In fact, uh, in uh, Barcelona, we had one of our largest customers at IoT Solution World Congress on stage with us talking about how um, the various healthcare diagnostic machines are smart and connected and how uh, those are managed in terms of um, the types of tests that can be done on those machines. So all the, the assets that are involved in providing healthcare uh, are smart and connected. So managing them, enabling them is, uh, is a check. So asset management of healthcare devices is a, is a very prolific set of use cases we work on. If you look at um, this other aspect I mentioned about all the data that we have about our, ourselves with all the variables that we have on us, getting all that data integrated and connected with, um, uh, with clinical setting data and then optimizing it and providing a single pane of glass uh, is, is a big set of use cases. If you look at uh, home care, the ability to provide elder care and patient care in remote settings, like I know we have worked on several dialysis care equipment, connected, um, it's all devices and machines that are connected that can provide a certain service uh, to the patient. So patient care solutions enabled by smart connected devices 
is an area of big focus. It's primarily asset management of the asset, but it enables you to do product as a service. I mean, the, the service is what matters, and you can now dispense of service at a very, a very fine-grained uh, control uh, viewpoint. In addition to that, I think uh, things to do with the provider space. If you look at um, anything to do with the hospital setting today, I mean, you look at a smart connected ICU, uh, how they all operate, how they, uh, frankly, um, we have done some very interesting work in the space and uh, realized um, how important time sensitive networks were in a hospital infrastructure in terms of making sure everything is calibrated to a simple baseline. And most often you walk into an operating room or you walk into an ICU, you find uh, devices that are operating on different clocks, uh, which are not synchronized at all. And so when you get that one pain at what was the patient, how was the patient doing at 1082 or 1052, sorry, um, that would be a very difficult thing to answer. Uh, so uh, healthcare is a very, a very interesting space. Healthcare is truly transforming, transformative. Um, People are aging. Uh, the ability to provide good quality care uh, effectively um, and then manage uh, the outcomes uh, is enabled by IoT. I, if you reach out to me personally, I'll provide you additional connects within the organization who can provide you a lot more details. Great. I've got uh, another <coughs> question. Poorly secured IoT devices and services can serve as a potential entry point for cyber attacks and expose user data to theft by leaving data streams inadequately protected. How do you address that? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important area of focus. Uh, security does not have a black and white answer saying, you know, a risk has been identified and it has been mitigated and it's done, right? Because the risks are always evolving. It's a continuous journey. We actually do security and threat assessments and we do uh, solutioning work. Uh, around that. I think uh, it's not the traditional perimeter-based security models uh, because IoT is is not just uh, millions of devices and endpoints, it's billions of them, right? So how do you uh, have a very tiered uh, architecture where you are reinforcing and securing uh, every element uh, uh, in the chain, right? Because one, as you said, right, one weak link somewhere is sufficient to to get uh, penetration in, right? And we have had many examples of where poorly protected endpoints have been used as access points to get in into the network and do DDoS kind of uh, attacks, right? Uh, so security is a big topic in itself. Uh, designing secure endpoints, designing good end-to-end uh, -end security all the way from provisioning the devices and the endpoints to actually managing uh, the data path and the control path more effectively is being done. I think a lot of innovation happening in that space. A couple of areas where I would uh, share some um, frameworks, right? As I mentioned earlier, the Industrial Internet Consortium is a good area where they have done, there is actually a security reference architecture uh, that we follow. Uh, we actually helped build it as well. And so every test bed that goes through the, if it's a connected worker test bed or a microgrid test bed, it has to go through the security assessment and the security review. Uh, the idea is security is big. Security is broad, uh, from doing SOCs and monitoring security uh, to actually uh, hardening an environment to and protecting it. Uh, we work in all those spaces, I think. One area that I would again request is uh, I'll provide you additional details on projects and uh, how endpoints are hardened, if it's a gateway or if it's a sensor uh, communication module. What are some of the things that you do to, to make sure that uh, it is protected or at least known risks are mitigated uh, because not everything is known and it's an evolving threat uh, pattern, right? Um, very, very interesting area. But look out, uh, read through some of the um, uh, reference architectures on security that are published by the Industrial Internet Consortium and some of the other bodies. In fact, uh, at World Economic Forum, in Davos this last uh, couple of months ago also, there's a safety and security uh, paper that we published along with uh, WEF uh, uh, around how, what frameworks will enable a better mitigation path to these risks. Great question. So the next question I have is, how can design and IoT go hand in hand? Uh, product design and uh, customer experiences are at the core of uh, product use. 
um, be it a large industrial asset or be it a consumable that we are wearing, right? Um, uh, design thinking, the, the sheer approach of design thinking and then designing products and services that are more customer friendly, more user friendly, uh, and enhances uh, and improves upon our likeliness of using those products and services is a, is a must too. I mean, um, design focus today uh, for any IoT endpoint. IoT endpoint could be a product or could be a service uh, enabled through an endpoint uh, is a must too. Uh, customer experiences uh, can only be done and thought through when you have a designer involved, somebody with a creative mind. So I, before we wrap up, I will say we don't have any more questions active. If anybody else out there has additional questions, please send them over to me so that uh, we can have those answered for you. Um, and in the meantime, I'd love to say thank you. It's wonderful to have you back. Um, we, we like to have alumni stay connected and stay connected in their roles and in, in their responsibilities, and it's fantastic to have you come back on campus. Um, it's an area that's got a lot of interest from our students, and um, I think you're going to have students following up based on some messages I've received while you're here. Excellent. I appreciate the opportunity. I just have to go eat some campus food before I get out of here. <laughs> I'm not sure you need to do that. Well, I, I don't see any additional questions that have come in. Jay Raj, I really would like to thank you very much for making thank the you. trip back to MIT. Um, and we appreciate that. Uh, for those that are online, this uh, webinar will be available after the broadcast. Um, a little bit later today or tomorrow, we should have this available for you for review or passing along to any of your colleagues that may be interested. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.